Hi and welcome back to a new video. We were looking at the MSI C690 Godlike end of December, which was an extremely expensive board. Today we're looking at a much cheaper solution, the C690 Torpedo, which is a bundle with an EK monoblock. But it's a completely different monoblock than everything that I've seen so far before. That will be definitely interesting and the price with 400 euro for a C690 board with monoblock is definitely interesting. Okay, so let's see how this will arrive at your place. We have the monoblock right here and the board here. From my first impression, the quality is very much on point of this product. It looks really good. We have an acrylic base, well, acrylic top, and I think it is a stainless steel plate for the bottom. It could also be brass, but I'm not 100% sure. I didn't find information about this. They're only stating that it's copper and acrylic, but I'm not sure if you would use copper for this like big piece that would kind of be a waste of material. Not sure if that would be the case. I think it's still, if you have more information about that, please let me know. But we have uh, LGA 1700 cold plate right here for the CPU. And if we turn it around, the inlet is right here. The water will go through here, through the cooling channels, exit on left and right, go all the way up here and on the outlet. And because it's circulating all the way around this plate as well, it's somehow also cooling this plate. I decided to quickly grab this file and make a tiny cut in here to like inspect further what kind of material this could be, but I'm pretty certain, pretty sure that this is steel because I could not find any kind of like this reddish material you would see from copper. That's why I'm pretty sure, pretty confident that this is steel. Now the board is very interesting and I would call it extremely unique uh, cooling design. It's the Torpedo EKX, as you can see on the chipset cooler marking. And if you would compare this with the normal MSI Torpedo board, they changed the heatsink. So they basically shrunk the heatsink a little bit on top and made this additional like step on here. And the way the cooling works is that you would first insert your CPU, obviously apply your thermal paste, and then you have thermal pads on here that would make contact to the monoblock. So you still have normal cooling blocks. It's, it's like a hybrid cooling design. It's an interesting, but at the same time also a bit unusual and weird hybrid design. I get the point. So you have your monoblock and the water is cooling the, we're assuming that it's a steel plate. And then you have thermal pads. These thermal pads are making contact with the heatsink and then you have additional thermal pads again and these are making contact with the MOSFETs. So we have a ton of layers between the MOSFET and the actual cooling fluid. Let's say it like that. So that is quite unusual. But then again, it's also a 16 phase CPU V-core design, which would mean that potentially the VRM will run cold anyway. So not much cooling will be required. So I guess this will be totally sufficient to do this like multiple layer approach, which will be worse than having a pure monoblock design. But like it should work quite well. I'm pretty confident about that. But at the same time, I was wondering if they made this board and they made this cutout specifically, then why, if you're already selling this as a bundle, why are you not just not making a like air cooled heatsink at all? Save five bucks and then invest this into the monoblock for having additional MOSFET cooling on there. That's something I'm not quite sure about why they did this. It could be that they wanted to keep the chance of using an AIO in the future or like an air cooler in the future but then again I'm not quite sure how many people will upgrade to a different cooling solution after the years. The first test setup is assembled using the Corsair block and I'm running the CPU completely stock. Now running 20 minutes of XCU stress test to see what kind of region we will enter for the VRM temperature and also for the CPU temperature. You can see at the start of the test it was still ramping up in the temperature but the last two minutes have been pretty consistent so I'm now starting 10 minutes of measurement. The 10 minutes of measurements are almost over, but I want to take these shots while it's still under load. You can see the CPU package power has been on an average of about 211 watt, which is definitely more than anything you would typically experience during a gaming load. The peak CPU temperature was 87 degrees Celsius with an average of 76 degrees Celsius. And if we go over to the VRM temperature, it was at about 72 degrees Celsius maximum. To verify that the MOSFET temperature is also correct, I placed a probe on the backside of the PCB. 
it's now decreasing because the test has just finished, but it was about five, six, seven degrees off. So we can assume that the software reading is correct. Decided to quickly test it again with a moderate overclock to 5.1 gigahertz. The CPU does not need that high V core because it's a rather good sample, I would call it. The average power consumption about 225 watts, about 30 watt more than previously. The peak temperature almost didn't change, 88, one degree Celsius increase. Average increased by three to 79 degrees Celsius. And looking at a MOSFET, there is still a lot of headroom with 77 degrees Celsius. I already mounted the EK backplate, removed the Corsair backplate and the Corsair cooler, already applied the thermal paste. Now I only have to add the thermal pads on these areas and mount the EK monoblock. Thermal pads are placed. Can definitely tell that it looks very nice. I have to admit it looks really good. There is a good improvement in temperatures, a quick verification that we're running the same test. It's again 5.1 gigahertz, same voltage, roughly the same power consumption, 228 watt on average. Looking at the temperatures, it's now 86 peak and 76 on average on the CPU. But we have a massive improvement in the VRM temperature. It's now 53 peak. So that is over 20 degrees Celsius improvement. Now all the results in detail. First of all, we're looking at the 12900K non-overclocked. On the bottom, you can see the Corsair XC7 RGB Pro Plug with a VRM temperature of 72 degrees Celsius, a CPU max temperature of 87 and CPU average at 76. Switching to the EK light block, the VRM temperature dropped by about 20 degrees Celsius to 51 max. The max CPU temperature was at 82, dropping by 5 degrees Celsius, and CPU average also dropping by 5 to 71 degrees Celsius. Now, if the 12900K is manually overclocked to 5.1 GHz, the Corsair XC7 RGB Pro does not really change that much. The peak temperature of the cores is almost identical, same as the average, but the VRM temperature increases to 77 degrees Celsius. Switching to the EK light block, the VRM temperature stays almost the same, but we have an increase of CPU max and average temperature, which is closing in to the Corsair XC7 block, but it's still like two or three degrees Celsius less. Overall, I'm positively impressed by the EK light block, because honestly, when I first looked at the cooling solution, having this like enormous amount of layers in between the power stages and then in the end the water itself, because going through two different layers of uh, thermal pads and like having the heatsink in between, I expected the temperatures to be much worse. But then that is actually quite nice. So we have VRM temperatures under load of about 50 degrees Celsius. And to be fully honest, if it was like a real monoblock, we would maybe look at like 45 degrees Celsius. But technically this won't matter. Like your VRM is not going to care if it's running at 45 or at like 50 or 55 degrees Celsius. And honestly, it's also not going to care if it's running at 77 degrees Celsius. I also want to point that out. The VRM on the board is good enough that it doesn't require any kind of additional cooling because 77 is still totally fine. It's a bit higher, it will have like a very tiny impact on the lifespan of the MOSFET, but like very tiny, maybe going from like eight years to like seven and a half or something like that, I don't know. But it's something you can definitely neglect. But overall, it performed much better than I expected, like going through all these different layers. Quality wise, totally fine. Also impressive if you keep in mind, if we compare this to a CPU only water block, the CPU only water block is only taking care of the heat of the CPU while talking about the entire loop. Because if the CPU is dissipating 220 watt, the cooling system is taking care of 220 watt. But if we use the monoblock, and then we might have additional 20 watt of the VRM, the cooling loop has to take care of 240 watt. And then keeping in mind that the EK block is cooling the CPU and the VRM, which is leading to a higher water temperature, and it still performed better on the CPU temperature than the CPU only water block. I'm impressed, pretty nice work from EK. Thumbs up from my side, pretty solid product and uh, yeah, definitely a good price performance I would call it. I hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for tuning in, see you next time, bye bye.